welcome to Pop... Wait, what are we? We're Popcorn, Popcorn History. History. We're doing too many things today. <laughs> God. Welcome to Popcorn History with the Freeborn County Historical Museum, Library, and Village. I'm Stephanie Kibler, Executive Director here with Risha Lilienthal, Coordinator Hi. of Exhibits and Collections, and Reggie Bauer, Power 96. Yes, what are you? Yeah. Operations Manager. Operations yeah. Manager, yep. Um, today now. I'm just gonna warn. I'm gonna warn everybody. Yeah. It's it's a crazy day. My day's upside down, um, <laughs> and our topics are really it's weird. Really weird. <laughs> mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, we're so gonna popcorn. Oh my gosh, probably it's All just right. gonna be an explosion. So just hold on to your hats, folks, because you might not be able to keep up. Yeah, kernels I have, flying. I have not been briefed on this one ahead of time, <laughs> so I might find something and just latch on it and you'll hear me furiously typing. Ooh, <laughs> little Reggie's clicks. being thrown to the wolves. <laughs> <laughs> or the seagulls. The seagulls, yep. Because today, we're starting with pirates. Ooh. Arr. 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we have pirates that relate to Freeborn County. Did you know? Did not Did you know? know, so I'm curious. So specifically, pirates from Pittsburgh. The pirates of Geneva. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Pirates of Geneva Lake. Why not? Oh, that'd be fun. But no, pirates from Pittsburgh. Pirates from Pittsburgh the, that relate like to the Albert sports Lee. sports team? Yeah. Or? Oh. Yeah. I'm still back to... Arr. Arr. Yeah. Uh, we had a resident who played professional baseball for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Also the Brooklyn Dodgers. Wow, hmm. who's yeah. that? His name was Mike Sitchko. Mike Sitchko. Mm-hmm. He played professional baseball in the mid to late 1940s. Wow. He also played with the Albert Lee Packers team for five years after that. And they were the 1954 league champs. So now buckle up. Because I've got a story happenstance for you here. It's pretty fun. Although I I would like to say we do have a glove in collections that was purchased and used by Mike Sitchko in 1946 when he played professional baseball. Oh, so wow. we do have that. So he not also when used he played it. for the Packers. When he also used it then during the Packers, but okay. he got it when he was a professional. Because I'm hoping we're going to be doing um, as we do our. What are they building the walls for? Business oh, exhibits yes. that we're working on. Um, I'm hoping part of that will include a little something on the Packers because that yeah. kind of relates to the meat packers. Yes. Yep. He um, was born in 1924 and died in 2015. He played left fielder and he bats right. Oh, wow. But, okay, here here's this really kind of crazy story here. Um, I'm pretty much going to like completely quote this one article by Kimberly Brown in 1996. So this is why we fastened our seatbelts? This is why you're okay. fastening your seatbelts here. This was written in the Orlando Sentinel in June. But uh, it's about Randy Sitchko, who got an official father. So... That was a first for the 48-year-old Lake County businessman. I, I, I wish that um, people could see, because Reggie and I are both like, why? Like, what? What? <laughs> uh-huh. So, most people around his area knew Sitchko, Randy Sitchko, as Randy Jensen. He was the owner of Connie's Shoes and a naturalizer, plus at the Lake Square Mall. But he changed his name to Sitchko in June 5th. Because that was his father's last name. Hmm. So his mother uh, supported all of his ventures. He said he went to school. uh, She went to school ball games and her baseball crazy son took him like to throw in the backyard and stuff. So he grew up without a father. Okay. Um, And he said Sandlot and backyard baseball became an important part of his childhood. And little did he know that that linked to his biological father who is Mike Sitchko. Hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and he um, always thought that he and his brothers and sisters had the same father, but they found a photograph up in the attic oh. of his mother with her brother and Mike Sitchko because they mm. were roommates. Oh, my God, they he, were roommates. Oh, they were roommates. <laughs> <laughs> and they were roommates. <laughs> She, she did make that Good. sound a little sketchy. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the summer of 1947, uh, Randy's mother visited her brother, Mark Kane, 
uh, when he was the pitcher of the Pittsburgh Pirates. So they were roommates and they were on the same team. And there was a weekend with a fun-filled party, and then it was over. Oh. And so she took that old team photo, and one of her and Mike Sitchko, and they looked at Mike and said, that's the spitting image of Randy. Randy's <laughs> the spitting image of Mike. And uh, so she had, uh, she passed away. And so the son was looking into, you know, his biological sure. family and stuff. And he saw this photo, and he kept digging and digging, and he found Sitchko's and Thompson, which I don't know what state that was, but Thompson mm-hmm. somewhere. Uh, and Thompson's in Georgia. Okay, maybe it was Georgia. Maybe. I don't know. But um, she then found the phone number from that family for somebody living in Albert Lee, which was Mike. And then he called huh. Mike, and he was like, oh, my gosh, I found you. <laughs> <laughs> and Mike said... Um, Who are you? <laughs> right? He, I, I, it doesn't say exactly how he initially reacted. Sure. But um, Randy was like, I'm a successful businessman and I don't want anything from you. I just want to know my father. Oh. And uh, so they met and um, he said, I can't believe it. I, I found my father. And uh, no tests were taken. Huh. They said we didn't need to. That's interesting. They said they looked exactly alike. Yeah. Genetics sometimes yeah. are I suppose powerful. sometimes you can tell. Yeah. Um, they went, he went to the airport and he met the following Father's Day. He visited Mike Sitchko and this was in Albert Lee. They had a family reunion and um, Mike Sitchko was one of nine children. And wow. Randy said they made us feel like we've always been a part of the family. He said the the love they showed was unbelievable. Oh. Yeah, and so they... So was this a Tribune article? No, this one was uh, from Kimberly Brown in the Orlando Sentinel. Oh, interesting. Yep, so it was, did you say that already? Yeah, maybe did. Yep, Sorry. at the beginning. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, it was from Randy's hometown. And okay. then so he went up to Mike, and Mike was somebody who fought in World War II. Um, he was the only survivor of his tank crew in the D-Day invasion. Oh, gee. Wow. He came home wounded, but he recovered enough to play baseball for the Army before being signed by the Pirates. Hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. So it was kind of um, neat for Randy, because not only did baseball provide lucky clues in search for his father, but... Um, also linked three generations together because his father did, he played, and his son um, played for championships and all-star games and hmm. stuff. So, That's yeah. interesting. Um, yeah, and then they all eventually, now that family moved to Florida, so that's where sure. they are. But Mike Sitchko was in Albert Lee. That's neat. That's my I, little happenstance that he found his father. Kind of neat. Um, that I I was expecting uh, more drama since my seatbelt was on. Oh, uh, <laughs> I, I was going to deliver it differently. I gave it away sooner than I wanted to, mm. but I, I just that's how it happened. That's how it came out of my mouth. Well, you were still safe with the seatbelt. Huh? Yes, yes. See, you didn't get hurt. <laughs> no, I didn't get hurt. Um, I just I I just had to do a little googling here and. Uh, did you know that the Port of Pittsburgh supports over 200 river terminals and barge industry service huh. suppliers? That sounds That's like nice. a lot. That sounds like a whole lot. I, I, was look, <laughs> I was trying to figure out where exactly, you know, what the ports of Pittsburgh were. Right. Oh, sure. Yeah. Because I was like, trying to type like pirates, oh. pirates in Pittsburgh. Oh, sure. Oh, why they would do. Oh, sure. Oh, they I don't know. A- I don't know. Maybe you can Maybe you can Google that. I didn't Google that. Zoom I just Googled, Googled the ports of Pittsburgh. <laughs> I, I actually had two motivations for that because I was just curious about how many ports they had because, like, pirates is kind of a weird name for a landlocked city. Yeah, though. it is. I oh. did. Oh. I, I think I found something. Before the 1890 season, almost all of the Allegheny. I'm already going to. Allegheny. Allegheny's. <laughs> almost all of the Allegheny's best players had gone to the Players League, which I guess was a different baseball league in the area. Okay. Um, had gone to the Players League's Pittsburgh Burgers, spelled B-U-R-G-H-E-R-S. 
<laughs> um, and then that league that the Pittsburgh Burgers was part of collapsed after that season, and so the players were allowed to go back to their old clubs. However, the Alleghenies also scooped up highly regarded second baseman Lou Bierbauer, who had previously played with the Philadelphia Athletics. And since um, the Athletics had failed to include Bierbauer on their reserve list, they protested you know, this move. And in an official complaint, um, an official for one of these other leagues had claimed the Allegheny signing of Bierbauer as piratical. Oh, Oh, that's an awesome piece of information. So they basically not quite stole, but kind of stole a player for their team. And then I guess the piratical... Um, That's a fun word. The incident uh, quickly accelerated into a schism between the leagues, it says oh. here, that contributed to the demise of the AA, Gosh. which was the name of this other league, uh, the American Association. Um, although the Alleghenies were never found guilty of wrongdoing, their allegedly piratical act gained them the occasional nickname Pirates starting in 1891, and then within a few years the nickname caught on with Pittsburgh newspapers, and it was first acknowledged on the team's uniforms in 1912. That's um, awesome. I, I like that. The words that were being thrown out. I love those. The piratical. <laughs> are, we on, are we on Wikipedia? Yes. I love Wikipedia. <laughs> I Demise. Too. Just yes. Um, I, so my, I did have, I had an ulterior motive because I was trying to tie Pittsburgh pirates shipwrecking. Yeah. I mean, pirates I do mean, sail like, you on know, ships. <laughs> like, I know, right? Because <laughs> I'm guessing pirates came in to the Great Lakes. At one point. Oh, that's Because you can yeah. come in. You can get there all the way from the Atlantic. Yes. It would start way up northeast, but you can get in there. Yes, oh because the, um, oh my gosh, what do they call? There's a, there's a group of old ships that come through and go into harbor at Lake Michigan. Mm-hmm. And that's oh. the route they take. They come up the east coast and go through the, go through the Great Lakes. Wow. And what made me think of that was um, the legend of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Yeah, which, as of the day that we're recording, is the 46-year anniversary. Exactly. What? It is. And it remains the most mysterious and controversial of all shipwrecked tales heard around the Great Lakes. I haven't heard this. You don't know the story of the Edmund Fitzgerald? Oh, man. This is like a local thing. Uh, Again, if they could see Reggie in my faces, they'd be... (laughs) For a guest. We, we learned about this in middle school. Oh. Elementary school, I'm sure of it. The song, The Wreck of the yeah. Edmund oh Fitzgerald. We pl- we're playing that on, on the station tonight around, oh, around the time it. That, it, that it sank, because it sank like 7, 7.15 or so at night. So yeah. I'm, Whoa. I'm like, in 1975, so I was like yep. 12. So I would, would have been middle school. Oh, wait, You're this right. This happened in 1975? The sinking did, yeah. Oh, oh, it it was, um, oh, did I not take down... I didn't mark down when when the ship first sailed, but it was a sturdy. She was a sturdy vessel, so I uh, think 1958. Let me double check. I think that's something like that. I think so. Um, and um, it, there's been books. There's been film. Tons of media coverage. Um, I was right. It was 58. Nice. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was just looking at this a couple of weeks ago because it was coming up. Sure. Yeah, and that I looked at it today, and I forgot to make a note of it for some reason. But um, the entire crew of twenty nine men um, died on Lake Superior. Lost oh. the entire crew. Yep. Um, Seventeen miles north northwest of Whitefish Point, Michigan. Mm-hmm. It actually happens to be Whitefish is actually also the home to the Great Lake Shipwreck Museum. If mm. anybody's curious, I've heard it's a great place to visit. Cool. Um, they've conducted three underwater expeditions. To the wreck. And I'm almost wondering if there hasn't been a fourth one done because I thought there was some talk not many years ago that they found some pieces of it. Oh. But I'm, I could be making that up. Let's I try see. not to do that, but once in a while. Just, <laughs> right. Um, in March 2005, the Whitefish Point Preservation Society accused the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society of conducting an unauthorized dive <gasps> to the Edmund yeah. Fitzgerald. Ooh. Although the director of the GLSHS uh, admitted to conducting a sonar scan of the wreck in 2002, he denied such a survey required a license at the time that it was carried out. Um, and so 
in an April 2005 amendment to the Ontario Heritage Act allowed the Ontario government to impose a license requirement on dives as well as the operation of submersibles, side scan sonars, or underwater cameras within a designated radius around protected sites. Okay. Um, I thought so. I could. I recalled some controversy on that. Yeah. Um, Canadian folk singer Gordon Lightfoot. Mm-hmm. I don't. Is he a one hit wonder? No, he's uh, got a couple other things out of. there. That's definitely the one that he's the most known for. But he also has another one that we actually, when we were still kind of very uh, fluid with our format here, um, he did have another one called Sundown that we that's played right, a little bit. That's right. Hmm. Um, he he wrote the he wrote a 1976 ballad about the Edmund Fitzgerald oh. called The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, mm-hmm. which created a ton of interest. I mean, it, that song, yep. I, I I don't care who you were, you knew that song. Yep. Huh. And it's a little spooky, too. It's oh. Well, it, the lyrics are great. And so, but my favorite is the first, I like the first verse. Yeah. Um, the legend lives on from the Chippewa and down of the big lake they called Gitchagumi. The lake, it is said, never gives up her dead when the skies of November turn gloomy. With a load of iron ore 26,000 tons more than the Edmund Fitzgerald weighed empty, that good ship and true was a bone to be chewed when the gales of November came early. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, Gitchagumi is a, um Ojibwe name. Oh. Meaning Great Sea, hmm. which I thought was really interesting. Makes sense, cool. yeah. And I kind of went down a rabbit hole here because when I was singing Shipwreck, I was going to really delve into Chris Nelson. Yeah, that's who I thought you were going who's to. Who's a Danish immigrant yeah. that came to Albert Lee. And on his route over here, he was actually shipwrecked. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, I think almost 700 people mm-hmm. died um, with just a handful of survivors. Yeah. Um, And so we've got his oral history at the museum talking about his experience. Um, But then I realized what day it was. Oh, sure. And and that it it was the anniversary of the Edmund Fitzgerald. And I just, um, I can remember the first time hearing this song, we cried in class. I mean, it was was very emotional, which is interesting because you don't really have a tie, didn't really have a tie to them, to anybody on there. Hmm. Um, but Chris was interesting too, and he was he was kind of a he had a little bit of humor to him. Mm-hmm. So in reading his his oral history, it was really fun to hear his personality come yeah. out. And so that is available at the museum, and people, I stop in and just. Uh, check with Linda and take a look at some of our oral histories because she does have them typed out and you can read them. Mm-hmm. Um, she can print a copy for you if you'd like to take it. Some of this, his story would be great for a history class. Oh my gosh, yeah. Well, he survived the biggest shipwreck before the Titanic. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, which one was Was that the. It was uh, the Norga. Oh, I'm looking for. Oh, I might be misremembering that. I didn't think he mentioned the name of the ship even in here. It's the Norga. N O R G E. Um, and and you would know that because you've done a lot of work with this too, because mm-hmm. he is plays a role in our immigration exhibit. Yep. Um, and our covered wagon game. That's right. Yeah, we're working on a <laughs> Freeborn County, County Trail, trail game. Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like the Oregon Trail. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's yeah. it'll be fun. So mm-hmm. hopefully, hopefully in the next month or so we'll yeah. have that out too. But um, yeah, I just I thought that was just a really Chris's story is really interesting. Mm-hmm. But I had to go to the Edmund Fitzgerald and the um, Gales of November coming early. Yeah. Well, and it is a gloomy sky in november today it yeah, is it actually is. it really <laughs> is you read that line and i was like oh, gasp <laughs> you did kind of gasp i did hear you the um every verse is is very mm-hmm. it's intense mm-hmm. they are intense yeah. lyrics. yeah well because you had said shipwrecks and i automatically thought of chris and then i thought about how after they shipwrecked and he was stranded on a boat with a whole bunch of other people, none of whom spoke his language, um, right. they ended up eating a seagull huh. that they caught. Oh, that's right. Delicious. Huh? Yeah. It probably tasted like chicken. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> ew. Um, but then I thought about bird watching, and so... <laughs> Uh, I decided to look into our lady, Maud Kovenig. Kovenig, I'm guessing is how you say it. Um, she was born 1904 and died 1993. 
and she was very instrumental in starting the um, National Audubon Society here, like so she, a part of the National Audubon Society, but the Albert Lee like chamber of it. Okay. Um, and she was writing a whole bunch of newspaper <clears throat> articles talking about birds in Albert Lee in Freeborn County. Um, they built a hundred bird houses one year, uh, and they divided them up and each member took and put them out in the like country of the county here. Hmm. And then later they would report on how many were occupied and that encouraged many of them to see how many of them had bluebirds. So they were looking into blue bluebirds a lot and they had talked about blue jays as well and how blue jays were growing, which I'm I'm kinda like, blue jays are mean. Why would you <laughs> want there to be a whole bunch of them? Blue jays are mean. They're so mean. They go after everybody. <laughs> They're I get, like the bullies. I get mad when they go after cardinals. They go after everybody. Because I, mean, I love cardinals. We had a spruce tree in our yard one summer, and all the little birds were nesting in there. And all of a sudden, you could hear all this ruckus. And here's this big old blue jay going in. Yeah. And all the other little birds, the chickadees, the cardinals, yeah. every robins band together and chase that blue jay off. <laughs> oh, they know okay, that's he's good. The bully. That's good. Get yeah. on out of here. Yeah. Give him some of his own medicine. <laughs> Um, and they were also helping out to figure out the state bird for Minnesota. Ooh. Oh. And uh, we also have an oral history of her at the museum. That's kind of what I'm looking at right now. And the interviewer asked, what bird was it that they were thinking about? And Kovenig says, oh, some of them wanted a goldfinch. Some wanted a blue jay, which would not have been too bad for a second choice, which I'm like, really? No, I, I'm glad we didn't have a blue jay. Yeah. Um, kind of throws the whole Minnesota nice thing out the window. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> and she said when the school children were asked, they picked all of the pretty colored birds that just stay here for a little while, so not really like Minnesota birds. Sure. Uh, and then she said, we thought the loon spoke for the prettiest part of Minnesota, the lakes, the wild country. So that's why the loon is, huh. you know, the Minnesota bird. There we go. And the loon's call is so unique. Yeah. Well, I guess all mm. bird calls are, but the loon, for I, for some, it's You would hear it and you than, know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Indiana is the cardinal, so that's that's one reason why I love the cardinal. Okay. And, um, like, the loon is probably the only other bird that I know as a state bird. Sure. Um, because I was born here and I have a lot of family here. But growing up, I always thought the loon kind of looked a little scary because it has the <laughs> red the eyes. red eyes. Yeah. It does like, have the red pretty, eyes. Like, it's pretty, but then you look right at the eyes. Soul. What was the movie with Katherine Hepburn and Jimmy Stewart? On Golden Pond. Oh. And she's calling the loons. <laughs> I can just hear her in my head. It it cracks me up every time I see her doing it. It's just hysterical. She's mm. it was such a great movie. If you haven't seen that, sure. it's a great movie. I mean I love Jimmy Stewart, so Yeah, Molly well, like, and Catherine right. what's not to love about Catherine Hepburn? I mean she's cool too, but Jimmy Jane, Stewart. Jane Fonda's in it. Oh, okay. Uh anyway. Sure. <laughs> <Pop>. <laughs> totally there popped. Go. Um, the interviewer on the same thing uh, talked about concluding the interview and wanted to ask her general reflections of the natural life in Albert Lee and how it's changed over the years. Uh, this was in 1978. So this is how um, she's reflecting on that time period. She said, it has changed very, very much. All the little wooded spots and vacant lots have disappeared. With this disappearance, so have the birds disappeared. A bird can't nest on a picket fence. There has to be food and shelter. The waves of warblers that used to go through the yards and the trees used to be full of them. Now, if I see a half dozen, I'm lucky, and that was right here in Oakwood. One time I saw six blue herons standing on the lake shore in the morning, five scarlet tanagers, and ducks on the lake. And um, she said they would just stop here on the way through, but um, she was talking about how less and less are stopping here, you know, just because of how the world is changing and how a lot of habitats are going down. And that was a main thing that she would write to the Albert Lee Tribune about was the uh, lack of habitats and then also the just general kind of I don't know how to explain it um, loss of attention to, oh, to our nature and helping uh, it grow oh, and, like the decline in interest yeah and, yeah 
Which has well, got us made me where sad. we are today. Right, yeah. like in the <laughs> pollution and yeah. all that jazz. I mean, yeah. I will say, you know, if you look, if growing up as a kid in the 70s, I can remember seeing the photos coming out of Los Angeles uh, and the smog problems and all of that. Oh. That's improved significantly. But, yeah, yeah, we've abandoned. We've recklessly. We've found other ways to <clears throat> destroy everything. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes, yes. I think of the Lorax. The yeah. Lorax. I'm trying to think. There's it, It's a ridiculous number of birds that are affected every time a tree is removed. I mean, it's like oh, when you... Oh, really? It's, it's not like you think like, oh, maybe there's two nests or something. Right? It's... it's oh. I just remember thinking that is a ridiculous number. Yeah. Um, but, like, if you look her name up, Maude Kovenig, if you look it up on just online and see some of the Tribune articles that are of her, it's all about um, history, not, uh, history of nature yeah. here. So she yeah. was a true environmentalist. Yes, very interesting. Very big. Um, the the bird thing was bird watching was interesting. Uh, for some reason, I threw out when we do this, we start throwing out ideas, and yeah. I threw out woodchuck. And I, I honest to God, I can't tell you why I threw out woodchuck. <laughs> but listening to you talk, the so Massachusetts, the state of Massachusetts has a state game bird, which is the wild oh. turkey. Uh-huh. Hmm. Because um, then I the other day I changed from woodchucks to turkey, yep. but then I went back to wait a minute. I can talk a little bit about woodchucks, <laughs> so I can go back and forth between woodchucks and turkeys, and I can even throw in kittens. Oh my gosh! I know, right? Weird. It's been a it's it, that's kind of how my day is felt. Yeah, kittens, woodchucks, and turkeys. <laughs> but so Conger here in um, well, it says Conger and Wells. I, I, oh, it's that close, same that yeah. area. The Otto Anaman Farm boasted as being in back in the 40s back Mm -hmm. in 30s and 40s boasted as being the largest turkey growers who own and operate their own incubators on their own farm Um, and by doing that they own machines on the farm they have lower overhead therefore being able to give the buyer better pulse at lower prices um but in 1940, a turkey tragedy on the Otto Anaman farm Uh-oh. near oh, Conger no. Did occurred. Did they get sick? When the storm of Tuesday night <gasps> cleared away, more than $13,000 worth of full-grown turkeys lay dead about their roosts oh. on this farm. Holy cow. The storm oh, came no. so suddenly they could save only about 1,000 of some 5,000 birds. Whoa. Hmm. Um, in spite of his efforts to round them up in the blinding snow and sleet, every minute the rescuers worked in the storm, they were risking their lives. Yeah. In spite of his loss, Otto could see a silver lining. I'm glad there were no members of my family lost, he said. Yeah. <clears throat> Some of the turkeys, and there's a picture of them, so they had to go in then the next day and clean them up. Oh, yeah. So the Tribune was there, you know, filming Yikes. while they were photographing while they were doing this. Um, they were frozen stiff, so the storm came so fast. They were caught so off guard that it was just like, so they were like Gone. frozen turkeys. Oh. The latest report is that 3 million turkeys were lost in the storm, about 100,000 in the southwestern part of Minnesota. Wow. That's a lot of turkeys. Wow, that's turkeys. right? That's a big storm, when, too. What, Three, I mean. What month was the storm? November. Of course like it was. just before Thanksgiving. November. 10th. Oh, <laughs> you're hitting this day. Yeah, that's I. You know, <laughs> that's one thing that came together for me today. <laughs> so the uh, 3,500 birds that that they photographed here were picked up. Uh, most of them loaded onto trucks and carted to rendering works in Mason City. Mm. But what a huge loss for that farm. Yeah. Man. And then I got to thinking, well, woodchucks. <laughs> Surely I can tie a woodchuck in somewhere with a turkey. Oh, my gosh. Um, and I found the opening day for the wild duck hunting season would be September 16th in 1924. Mm-hmm. Hunters are anxiously awaiting the day as all indications are for a good hunting season. And I thought, oh, surely this is going to be it. The season for quail, partridge, and ruffed grouse. Okay, that's not turkeys. (laughs) The season for woodchucks. (laughs) October 15th to November. They actually hunted woodchuck. There was a woodchuck hunting season. 
That's and funny. I, I thought, well, that's kind of sad. <laughs> Reggie's so, over there laughing. You're like, oh. I was, because we're struggling with woodchuck. So we we've got the one in the village, which we are inappropriately have named him, nicknamed him Fatty. Because he's no, too, he's bubble butt. Oh, I've I've heard other I've heard been told otherwise. But he's too big to fit in a cage. Yeah, in a live. We trap. can't get him in a live trap. He's too big. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we have one at the rock garden. Who is that's King Chuck? King Chuck. <laughs> yeah. We're not going Chucky. Oh, just King Chuck. King Chuck. <laughs> so. 12 13 1911, the Freeborn County Standard wrote Miss Wildred Wessos, who lives with her grandfather Oscar Torreson on a farm near Northfield, has a pet woodchuck, which oh she caught last gosh. summer and tamed. <laughs> Chuck, as she calls the animal, lives in the house like one of the family. <gasps> He's a perfect gentleman, Miss Wessos says, and a much nicer to have around the house than a dog or cat. How is it potty trained? She, the- t- she trained it. Oh my I don't know. Goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and then my final little bit of popcorn. Yeah. At the Freeborn County Fair, two little white kittens, the litter of puppies, the owl, and woodchuck excited interest in the poultry department. <laughs> oh my goodness. I would imagine. <laughs> I feel like that pet woodchuck needs to be like a children's story. Do you think woodchucks eat popcorn? Probably. 